Hi, Sufian. Hi, Sarah. Oops, sorry. It is time to begin, my friends. Thank you for joining us. Let's say a proper hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Science Rendezvous 2021. Wow, Science Rendezvous, our annual science festival with 300 different events happening over 30 Canadian cities. This is Canadian science connecting with all of you. You get to see what's happening in the world of science. Uh, here in Canada. It's pretty spectacular. And this event, one of those 300, is called Take Me to Space. Because we're all going to go to space. We're going to take you to space. You're going to take us to space. We're all going to go to space. And it's presented by the University of Guelph Humber in partnership with Astronomy in Action and Let's Get Together. My name is Ryan and I'm going to be your astronomer slash host slash friend as we go and explore six different aspects of what it's like to live in outer space on the International Space Station. We are gonna do some interactive games as well. And if you haven't used Kahoot before, you can either use the Kahoot app or go to the website kahoot.it so that you can participate in the different games that we're gonna play throughout um, our session on Take Me to Space. Okay, so you can get that ready anytime. Our first Kahoot's gonna happen um, in a little bit. Now, we're also going to hear from a lot of volunteer students at the University of Guelph Humber who are going to help us learn about all these different aspects of space flight, about what it's like for uh, an astronaut to exercise in space and why they need to exercise in space. What it's like to maintain your personal hygiene in space and from brushing your teeth to going to the bathroom, uh, how you eat food in space, because it's a little bit different up there than it is down here. How do you sleep in outer space, especially when you're flying around the earth really fast? How do you maintain your mental health and personal well-being? And uh, of course, how, how are you sustainable? How do you manage your waste in outer space? So um, we're gonna get started and I, I'd like to show you a little bit about where, where we're gonna go, what we're gonna look at. This is the International Space Station. This is, believe it or not, the most expensive thing ever built by humans. It is a space laboratory orbiting the Earth at over 400 kilometers above the surface, traveling at 27,000 kilometers per hour. There are anywhere from three to 11 astronauts living up here um, at all times. And this thing travels all the way around the Earth every hour and a half, which means those astronauts who are living up there, they get to see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every single day. It's an amazing place where humans are learning how to fly or how to fly in space for a very long time. Because if we want to go places like the moon, well, the moon's three days away. That's not too bad on a spaceship. But if we want to go to Mars, Mars takes nine months to reach on a spaceship. So it's, it's quite far. So you've got to be able to live in space for a very long time. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about when it comes to living in space is exercise. Why do astronauts need to exercise in space? Well, you know, you and I, right now, where you're sitting, 
or standing or however you're watching us today, you're on the earth and you're using your muscles. You're fighting the gravity of the earth. You're using your leg muscles or your back muscles. I'm using my shoulders right now to keep my head up and my neck to keep my head up, right? You use your muscles every day and that makes you tired. But in the environment of space where there's microgravity, astronauts can float around and they don't need to use their muscles as much. So it's really important that they get some exercise to stay strong. So we're gonna learn a little bit about what it's like to exercise in outer space. I'll see you shortly. Muscle atrophy in space. First, let's break down the definition of muscle in space. Atrophy. Astronauts in space will eat three meals each day that are made special just for them. Nutritionists design each a muscle helps us produce force to ensure that they are able to get the right amount of calories and nutrients. So what do we use meals that muscle change all the time as to well move as the our bodies that are in those meals? Astronauts have to send what regular samples atrophy? back to Earth for analysis by nutritionists, who will then design the atrophy next is when our muscle cells Astronauts get can smaller. Also request certain foods and they are best incorporated into their diet. By this the results in the weakening of our muscles, in which space, causes us to feel bone tired is the and most weak. important thing that astronauts need to worry about. Nutrients that are important to bone muscle health are calcium, calcium happens, iron, as vitamin you get older, D, and vitamin K. When you K. sit too much, when you fall sick pay special or ill. attention to these nutrients when designing Active the Active muscles diet. are done when you perform Not any enough exercise these nutrients with or without nutrient deficiency. Which can have long lasting muscles, which are done the through basic of the training. astronaut once they return back from space. What about muscle atrophy in space? If you recall muscle atrophy, astronauts experience it because they float in space. They don't use muscles like we do on Earth. Astronauts have something called anti gravity muscles, which are found at their neck, back, their thighs, and all right, all right, all right. We're gonna we're gonna come back. We're gonna do that again because that was a little bit of a mistake on my part. We're gonna try that again with just one audio source this time. So let's give that a better go. Muscle atrophy in space. First, let's break down the definition of muscle atrophy. A muscle helps us produce force and motion. So what do we use our muscles for? To move our bodies. What about atrophy? Atrophy is when our muscle cells get smaller. This results in the weakening of our muscles, which causes us to feel tired and weak. Muscle atrophy on Earth happens as you get older, when you sit too much, or you fall sick or ill. Active muscles are done when you perform any exercise with or without exercise equipment, compared to passive muscles, which are done through basic stretching. What about muscle atrophy in space? If you recall muscle atrophy, astronauts experience it because they float in space. They don't use muscles like we do on Earth. Astronauts have something called anti-gravity muscles, which are found at their neck, back, their thighs, and their calves. The reason why astronauts have these anti-gravity muscles is because they work in a weightless environment. With the less gravity in space, the less muscles are needed to help their body move around. If you became an astronaut, can you find your anti-gravity muscles on your body? This is why astronauts exercise about more than two hours a day. Did you know? Studies have shown that astronauts experience up to 20% loss of muscle mass on space flights lasting five to 11 days. This is why astronauts want to maintain the muscles to safely arrive back to planet Earth. Fun fact, the New York Times recently shared that astronaut Scott Kelly's heart shrank after spending nearly a year in space. 
So over his 340 days in space, his heart shrank from 6.7 to 4.9 ounces, which showed a decline of 27%. This is about the weight of a medium-sized athlete. Although his heart was able to adapt to the less gravity in space, Dr. Kelly remained reasonably fit. Anything else you would like to learn more about muscle atrophy in space? Let us know. Body fluids in space. There are many types of fluids in our body that each serve a purpose to maintain optimal function and health of our bodies. Some fluids you may be familiar with include saliva, blood, urine, sweat, and mucus, which can be seen coming out of your nose on a very cold day. Now, there are some fluids in your body that you may be unaware of, which also serve very important roles to our health. These include lymph, plasma, bile, and cerebral spinal fluid. When astronauts are sent into space, some of these important fluids are affected by the environmental conditions imposed by space. On Earth, the force of gravity pushes body fluids, such as blood, down below our chest. If you'd like to test this out, you can hang your hand down by your side without moving it for just a few seconds. And you'll notice the veins on the back of your hand will become bigger and more noticeable. This is due to gravity pushing the blood down. Once you raise your hand up over your head, it'll go away very quickly. In space, the force of gravity is very weak. Therefore, our body fluids in our legs will shift towards your head, causing a puffy face, and your legs will look very skinny, almost bird-like. The excess fluid in the head can cause problems because the fluid creates pressure on the nerves in our brain, which can cause nose stuffiness and eye impairment. Moreover, due to the lack of gravity in space, our cardiovascular system does not work as hard. There will be a decrease in the amount of blood in the body. There will also be a decrease in plasma, which helps transport nutrients all across our body. And our red blood cells, which help carry oxygen all around our body, will also decrease. These changes in our body are normal in space conditions. But when it's time for the astronauts to come back home, they may feel dizzy and may even faint. This happens because the body needs to adapt to the increased force of gravity present on Earth. All right, so moving on, we'll be talking about exercise equipment and what you can use to exercise in space. So first of all, how do you stay active? Do you like to run or lift weights? Or do you enjoy sports? Who here plays soccer or hockey? Or what about basketball? What do you do to stay active? <clears throat> What about weights? They're a great way to stay active and build muscle. Who here has tried lifting the weights? Yeah, it's super tiring and heavy, right? But can someone tell me why this wouldn't work in space? Exactly, there's no gravity. So when the astronauts are up in space, there's no gravity pulling things down, so, they're, so lifting the weights would be super easy for them. They'd just float around and they wouldn't have to lift the weights. So if we can't use weights to exercise, then what can we use? Well, even here on Earth, resistance bands are a great way of exercising, and they work in space. But if you have, but you have to make sure that you're tied down so you don't float away. Resistance bands are an elastic band that is stretchy, and they're all different difficulties. Some are easy to stretch, and some are more hard. You can use them in all sorts of ways. You can pull them with your arms, or you can use them to squat. They're so versatile. Resistance bands are the perfect way to stay active and strong in space. Now, in the space station, they have lots of fancy machines and equipment for astronauts to use to stay active. So let's take a look at those. So as you can imagine, there are some special equipment, uh, exercise equipment that you can have to use while you're in space. Uh, so I'm sure everybody has seen a treadmill or heard of one before. Uh, so similar to the ones that we have on Earth in space, you will just simply be running or walking on the spot, working on your cardio. However, you will actually be attached um, so that you aren't moving around and you can stay in the same spot while you are exercising. Similar to the treadmill, there is a bike machine where again you are strapped in so you're not moving around but you can continue to work your legs um, while staying in one spot. Um, you don't have to focus too much about 
uh, your structure and things like that because you are uh, strapped in to stay in the same place. As well as things you may see at the gym, um, they also have things like squat racks um, and deadlifts machines, as uh, so you can work more on strength as seen in these pictures. However, they are using a resistance band style. Uh, so you are being pulled downwards, however you are resisting the force and pressing upwards by working your muscles. Um, so similar to, as previously mentioned, there are some limitations to some different exercises in space. And I want you to think about some things. So what would happen if you were to jump rope in space, for example, or try to do a chin up? What about things, different sports that involve balls like tennis or basketball or soccer? or a different dance style like yoga or Zumba or things like that. How do you think that would go in space? Uh, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Hi everyone, my name is Miriam and I am in my second year of the kinesiology program. I'm Lauren and I'm in my second year of the psychology program. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation so far in our pod. Lauren and I would like to share a few fun facts as well. Firstly, there's a huge misconception that there's zero gravity in space when in fact, you can find some gravity when you're in outer space, and it's referred to as microgravity. Hmm. Essentially, when you're in space, you are in a state of free fall that you feel when you're skydiving or those feelings you get after a drop in a roller coaster. And astronauts will feel that way for the entirety of their mission. Wow, that would make me feel so sick. Exactly, space sickness is something that all astronauts need to prepare for. Hmm. Interesting. Well, a second common misconception is that humans only have five senses, when in reality, there's much more than just our sense of sight, touch, taste, smell, and sound. Some of our other senses include our ability to sense hot and cold, of hunger and thirst, itch and of balance. Right. Aren't there three systems that help us maintain our sense of balance? That's right. So in conjunction with our sense of sight and of touch, those three systems are our visual, proprioceptive, and vestibular, which work together to make sure we are staying balanced and upright. So um, to understand proprioceptive, it's basically our ability to know where our hands and our feet are, even when our eyes are closed. You got it. <laughs> and um, for the vestibular system, it's the inner, it's the fluids in our inner ears that with the use of, um, of Earth's gravity, pulls them down and it helps us to determine up from down. That makes a lot of sense when you relate it back to what we learned about with microgravity. In space, with the very little amount of gravity, astronauts will have a hard time maintaining their balance because their vestibular system is malfunctioning because those fluids aren't being pulled down by gravity and they don't know what's up or down. I actually have a great activity that puts all of those systems to the test. Would you like to participate? I'd love to, Miriam. Okay. Everyone at home, you are more than welcome to join in. All you need is an open area. So I am going to move the chair I'm sitting on, and Lauren will as well. It is also not a bad idea to maybe have someone around you, just in case you feel a little wobbly, because we are trying to find our balance. So we'll start off with standing on both feet and closing our eyes. Lauren, how do you feel? You know, very stable, only a little bit wobbly. Okay. At that point, we'd only taken away one of our systems and that was our visual. Let's take it up a notch. Stand with your eyes closed again and lift one foot off the ground. How does that feel, Lauren? <laughs> this is so hard. <laughs> Exactly. Put your foot back down and grab a seat. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Miriam, now that we're seated, can I please ask you why the second activity was so much more difficult than the first? Of course. So that second challenge was much more difficult because we had taken away two of our three systems, and that was our visual and proprioceptive. And so we had to rely on just our vestibular sense. So try to imagine how astronauts feel when they're in space and all three of their systems are malfunctioning. It is so hard to tell what's up and down and just to keep their balance. Well, I could only imagine those poor astronauts. I know. Anyways, 
Lauren and I would like to thank you for listening to our Exercise in Space pod. We hope you enjoyed learning about muscle atrophy, fluids in our body, types of exercises, and participating in our balance activity. See you in the next pod. Bye. That was really fun. <laughs> I love that experiment. That was one of, that's one of my favorite ones to do, although you really have to do that when there's somebody else around to watch you so that you don't fall over and hurt yourself. So please do be careful if you're gonna try that at home, but that was really amazing. I'd like to thank the exercise volunteers, Mary and Madeline, Alyssa, Josue, Natalie, Lauren, and uh, Shermaine for doing such great work on that exercise video. That was really fun. So I hope you learned a little bit more about what it's like for astronauts to exercise in space. Turns out there's a lot involved, isn't it? A little bit different than working out um, here on Earth, but you know that's that's astronaut life for you. Uh, the next section that we're going to tackle is actually personal hygiene in space, and and it's things that you and I take for granted uh, on planet Earth. You know, astronauts they they have to do a lot of extra things. They have to do they have to be a little bit careful when they brush their teeth. They have to be especially careful when they go to the bathroom. And so we're going to hear from. Uh, some of the students talking about personal hygiene in outer space. Let's bounce over and see what they have to say. Hello, and welcome to the Personal Hygiene in Space pod, where we'll explore what it's like to shower, shave, cut your hair, use the washroom, trim your nails, and brush your teeth all in space. Beginning first with showering in space. The average shower on Earth takes around eight minutes, whereas in space, it is much, much longer, averaging around two hours. It is critically important to conserve water in space. Astronauts use approximately 2.84 liters of water per shower in space, compared to 65 liters of water per shower on Earth. And while body wash, shampoo, and conditioner are packaged separately on Earth, there's an all-in-one soap product that is used in space. And as we'll see in the next slide, no rinse shampoo is a must. Sometimes the water gets away from you. You try and catch as much as you can. I just work the water up through to the end of my hair. And I take my no rinse shampoo and squirt it also on the scalp a little bit and rub it in. Again, kind of working it out to the end. Sometimes I'll actually take my comb, work it all the way to the ends. And I like to take my towel while I have the shampoo in there and just kind of work it. Because without standing under running water, you kind of need to use the towel a little bit to help get some of the dirt out. Now, what about shaving in space? Turns out the process is remarkably similar to shaving on Earth. One important distinction is that the razor is attached to a mini vacuum so that the hair is collected properly instead of floating all over the place. Similarly to shaving in space, haircuts in space also require a special vacuum. Paying attention to hair growth is important aboard the space station because it allows the astronauts to better understand their health, such as recognizing if they need to intake more vitamins or minerals. Now, what about using the washroom? This is definitely the most challenging aspect of personal hygiene in space. When in space, astronauts actually have to strap themselves down to the toilet. Liquid waste goes into a tube to get filtered, whereas solid waste is captured into a bag and disposed of. The clothes on our backs keep us warm and protected from environmental elements. So can clothes be cleaned in space? Well, the answer is actually no, because there's no such thing as doing laundry in space. But there are special clothes that are worn. A combination of cotton and paper materials are new fabrics created with improved thermal and sweat management to maintain an astronaut's cooling and reduce microbiological contamination in a spacecraft. When it comes to dirty laundry, there are four options. Option one is to rewear the clothing for as long as possible. And yes, this even includes your underwear. Option two is to turn the clothing into a shooting star. Dirty clothes are sent in a non-reusable spacecraft to burn up in Earth's atmosphere. Option three is to grow plants using clothing instead of soil. One NASA astronaut figured out that he could create a planter out of an old pair of underwear and space toilet paper. 
currently being researched is a potential option for, whereas dirty clothing is actually fed to bacteria. Scientists said that this system could also dispose of other station trash as well. Do fingernails and toenails grow in space? You betcha. When it comes to trimming nails, astronauts do so above an air duct, such that the clippings are sucked up into a filter, which the astronaut can then clean and dispose of afterwards. And last but not least, we'll consider how to brush your teeth in space. We'll be turning to Chris Hadfield to explain this process to it, but spoiler alert, the astronauts actually have to swallow their toothpaste. Tech me from B-Town, Ontario asked, is it challenging to brush your teeth in space without getting toothpaste up your nose from weightlessness? Well, let, let's talk about how to brush your teeth in space. Standard toothbrush, nothing magical there. But we got a few different things. We don't have running water. You can't have a tap. You can't have a sink because water would flow everywhere. Uh, and, and so what do you do to wet your toothbrush and where do you spit afterwards? Those are the big questions. So uh, first we just fill up a water bag with water and this is what we're gonna put on our toothpaste. So let me get a ball of water here. There's a nice ball of water floating in the end. Shut off the straw very carefully. Okay, and get my toothbrush wet. Toothbrushes soak up water nicely. So now I have a nice wet toothbrush. Good, so I'm part way there. Got my toothbrush wet. Now I just need to put some toothpaste on it, on it and uh, get cleaning my teeth. So I'm gonna suck the water off it because where else would it go? Nice wet toothbrush, grab some toothpaste. We just use standard toothpaste in space. Squeeze a little on, not too much because you're gonna have to clean it up later. Okay, so there's my toothpaste on my toothbrush. It's wet, it's ready to go, it's loaded. Brush my teeth just like normal. Get them all, especially the ones in the back. You should brush your teeth for about as long as you can sing happy birthday. That should be long enough. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, I've got a mouthful of toothpaste stuff. I got a dirty toothbrush. So what I do is I just swallow the toothpaste. It's edible, won't kill you. And what else am I gonna do? Put it in a rag and have a dirty rag? Doesn't make any sense. So uh, in space, you don't swallow your toothpaste. It leaves my toothbrush just a little bit dirty. So I need to find where my water went and rinse it out. Fortunately, things are weightless, so things don't go too far. So here's my water again. So now I'll uh, get a little water on my mouth. Rinse out my toothbrush. So I have a relatively clean, slightly damp toothbrush to put back in my toothbrush case. Uh, the toothpaste is hung back on the wall. We communally share one toothpaste tube, just like living in a dormitory. And I still have good water to drink. And uh, it doesn't go up your nose. There's nothing to push it up your nose. It just floats, so, uh, so it works fine. That's how you brush your teeth in space. And now it's time for a live Kahoot. So either split your it screen or use your mobile device. Kahoot, our first, uh, we're gonna test you, I think, on all the things that you learned from that last video. I think the hardest thing for me would be having to swallow toothpaste. It's gross. I like mint, but I don't know about swallowing toothpaste. Maybe that'd be better for somebody else. But we're gonna do our first Kahoot. So again, you can go to kahoot.it or use the Kahoot app to join us. And I'm gonna welcome two of our students to host this amazing Kahoot. We're gonna welcome Talene and Leanna. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that presentation on personal hygiene in space. So we're gonna wait about one minute just for everyone to be able to join. So everyone that wants to join, get in there. All right, we have three people. So we're going to be seeing what we remember from the presentation. Awesome, we have so many people joining. Great, we're gonna just do maybe 30 more seconds. What is a pin? 
Uh, the PIN is 9285751. So I think Ryan just highlighted it there. It's right at the top of the screen. So 9285751. Awesome, we have 34 people. Just maybe do a few more seconds. So get it in there if you want to join. Okay, I think that's just about it. We want to begin. Last call if you want to join. All right. I think that should be good. Ryan, I think we are ready to go. Let's do it. All right. So first question, three, two, one. Let's get started. On average, how many liters of water is used when showering in space? 4.82, 8.42, 2.84, 2.48. These are close numbers. Which one is it? How many liters when showering? Two seconds. All right, so the correct answer, most people got it right. Great job. So 2.84 liters when you're showering in space. Awesome job, everyone. Let's take us to the scoreboard. All right, great job. We have some high points already. All right, let's go on to the next question. Okay, question two. Aside from scissors and clippers, what is the most important piece of equipment used for haircuts in space? So is it the wash basin, the vacuum? Is it a comb or is it a blow dryer? We have 10 seconds on the clock. Put in those answers. What's the most important piece when cutting hair in space? And that's time. Wow, majority of you got the right answer and the right answer is vacuum, amazing. You don't want those hairs flying everywhere. Let's see the scoreboard. Ooh, and Ania takes first place. Amazing job. All right, so on to the next question, number three. We have a true or false. Astronauts do not need a vacuum while trimming long facial hair. So true or false? I'll give you a hint. Think about haircuts. It's kind of along the same line. So true or false? So the correct answer is false. So when we're trimming long hairs or long facial hair, we're definitely going to want to vacuum just like the haircuts so that we don't have those fl hairs flying everywhere like Talene said. Great job, everyone. Let's see that scoreboard. All right, same first place. We have some people moving below, but great job. On to the next question. Question four, what is said to be the hardest aspect of personal hygiene in space? Is going to the washroom the hardest? Is shaving the hardest? Is doing your laundry the hardest? Or is it nail clipping that's the hardest? I did the, I, I already picked. Amazing. Five seconds on the clock. Two, one. Correct answer is going to the washroom. Good job. Majority of you got the correct answer. Going to the washroom super hard in space. Let's see the scoreboard, drum roll. Wow, Ania takes first place again, and Alyssa comes in for second place. Let's move on to question five. All right, question five. When dealing with dirty laundry in space, which option is true? Is it recycled to make new clothes? Do the clothes turn into shooting stars? Are the clothes washed clean? Or do we reuse the clothes to fix the spacecraft? So what do we do with our dirty laundry? Shooting stars. Two seconds. All right, yes, correct. Clothes turn into shooting stars. Most people got that right, great job. Let's see the scoreboard. 
All right, Mia's still in first place. Alyssa's still in second. And five players just dropped their answer streak, but let's see if we could get it back. We have a couple more questions. Question six, where do astronauts cut their nails to ensure that their nails do not float around in all directions? Do they cut their nails over a garbage can, beside an air duct, inside a closet, or in the shower? So what do they do to make sure that their nails don't fly everywhere in the spacecraft? Three seconds, two, one, that's time. The correct answer is they cut their nails beside an air duct. So it vacuums all their nails so that their nails don't fly everywhere. And let's see that scoreboard again. Ania is still in first place, amazing. Alyssa is still in second. Honda Civic has the highest answer streak of six, amazing. Let's go on to the next question, last one. All right, last question. What do astronauts do with the toothpaste after they brush their teeth? So let's link back to the Chris Hadfield video. So do you spit it into a sink? Do you spit it into a water tube? Do you spit it out into a, a towel? Or do you swallow the toothpaste? Which one is it? Three more seconds. And that's time. Which one is it? Awesome. So almost everybody got it right. Great job. Swallow the toothpaste after brushing your teeth in space. So let's see the scoreboard. And All in right. third place, third place. Ahead, <laughs> second place, we have Alyssa. And in first place, drum roll, please. Ania, congratulations. Good job, everyone. Super smart. Great job, everyone. Thanks for playing. That was excellent. Ania, well done. Seven out of seven. Somebody was paying attention. Somebody knows their space stuff. And thank you to Talene and Leanna for doing a great job running that Kahoot. And especially to all of the personal hygiene uh, volunteers from the University of Guelph Humber. We've got Luca, Leanna, Mary Rose, of course, Talene as well, Luca, Christian, and Ariel. Thanks for doing such a great job with personal hygiene in space. I saw a really interesting comment in uh, the chat window that I, I wanted to talk about because we've got a couple extra minutes is, um, uh, Darm says, astronauts are actually in a free fall, but they don't fall to the earth because the earth is round. The astronauts miss the earth because the earth is a sphere. That is absolutely right. The International Space Station, believe it or not, is falling around the earth. It's kind of like if you took if you took a ball, like my squishy moon here, and threw it as high up and as far and as fast as you can, no matter how hard you throw it or I, or I throw it, I'm not strong enough, it goes up and it comes back down. That ball is actually orbiting the earth. The problem is the earth gets in the way. And so what we can do is if we fire a rocket, we send it up around the earth and instead of hitting the earth, the ball or the rocket or the satellite or whatever you're doing is, is flying around, it's falling toward the earth, Whoop, falling toward the earth, falling, falling, but it keeps missing the earth because it's moving sideways so, so quickly. So that's what spaceships are doing. That means that everything in space is falling towards something else. The International Space Station is falling toward the Earth at 27,000 kilometers an hour. The moon is falling toward the Earth. The Earth is falling toward the sun. It's called free fall. And so those astronauts on board the International Space Station, they are skydiving for six months while they're up in space. Isn't that crazy? So if you ever see a skydiver kind of floating, they're doing what astronauts are doing, which is pretty amazing. All right, so thank you everybody for that, that great job. Now we are gonna go into our next section and that is uh, something that, that I'm quite fond of, <laughs> that I'm sure everybody is quite fond of. We all have to do it. We have to do some eating in space. And for this one, I'm going to introduce another of our excellent volunteers to tell us a little bit of a story about eating in space. Let's welcome Michaela. Hey, Michaela. Hi everyone. So let's just take a minute to think about our food. Think about how many times your family goes to the store. Maybe you go once a week, maybe you go every other week. Think about all the different kinds of food you buy. Fresh fruits and vegetables, milk, bread, eggs, pasta, meat, cereal. Maybe you pick up some ice cream and cookies. 
And when you bring all those delicious foods home, you put them in the fridge or in the cupboards where they're available for you to grab whenever you're hungry. Now think about when you go camping, you need to buy, package, and prepare all of your food before you leave. You need to figure out how to store it to make sure it won't go bad and how to prepare it at the campsite. If you have a long trek from the car to the campsite, you need to make sure your food isn't too heavy to carry along with all of your other camping gear. Now picture you're going to the International Space Station for six months. No quick runs to the store, no fridge or stove, plus all of the other equipment on the shuttle. Can you imagine all the hard work that has to go into preparing for that? Not only that, but you have to make sure the astronauts will actually enjoy the food. Hopefully through the information available today, you can learn more about how we eat in space. Now let's take a bit to watch a quick video. Amazing, thank you so much for that. Let's intro our eating in space video. Proper nutrition is extremely important when in space. Astronauts in space will eat three meals each day that are made special just for them. Nutritionists design each astronaut's meal plan carefully to ensure that they are able to get the right amount of calories and nutrients. Meals change all the time, as well as the nutrients that are in those meals. Astronauts have to send regular samples back to Earth for analysis by nutritionists, who will then design their next meals. Astronauts can also request certain foods, and they are best incorporated into their diet by the nutritionists. In space, Bone health is the most important thing that astronauts need to worry about. Nutrients that are important to bone health are calcium, iron, vitamin D, and vitamin K. Nutritionists pay special attention to these nutrients when designing the astronaut's diet. Not enough of these nutrients will cause a nutrient deficiency, which can have long-lasting effects on the bone of the astronaut once they return back from space. Space food is a type of food product created and processed for consumption by astronauts during the mission to outer space. The food has specific requirements of providing balanced nutrition for individuals working in space while being safely stored, prepared, and consumed in the spacecraft. Food must meet certain criteria to be allowed in the orbit. For example, food has to be compact, lightweight, nutritious, tasty, sticky, and processed. Let's take a look at a typical menu in space. There are six different types of food consumed on the International Space Station. The first is fresh foods, which includes fruits or vegetables. The second is foods in their natural form, such as nuts like almonds and cashews. The third is dried foods. This includes any foods with low moisture, such as dried apricots, dried prunes, or even dried beef. The fourth is irradiated foods. This means that the food is treated with radiation to extend the shelf life and prevent foods from spoiling. The fifth is dehydrated foods. These are foods that have their water removed to extend the shelf life and reduce weight. Lastly, the sixth is the thermostabilized foods. This happens when foods are prepared through a heat process, which helps to destroy anything that may cause spoilage. This is a small sample of what may be on the International Space Station menu. The first thing is a drink of choice. For this example, a juice is made by just adding water and sipping through the special straw. Scrambled eggs are also popular in space. Crew members will need to rehydrate the pre-cooked eggs by just adding warm water. Tortillas are also a great option as they do not produce crumbs, are easy to handle and reduce gravity, and they are able to stay fresh longer than regular bread. Next, we have shrimp cocktails. This comes in a dehydrated package that requires adding water into it. Carrots are also a great healthy option that needs to be eaten within days of arrival to make sure they stay fresh. Beef steak is also a great protein-dense meal option that is typically prepared through irradiation. Once on the space station, the food has to be prepared properly so the astronauts can eat it. For some foods, they just need to open the can or package and enjoy. But dehydrated foods can't be eaten without adding water back. As you can see in the top left, the special package connects to the rehydration station and astronauts can add in the exact amount of water recommended. Once all of the water has soaked in, they carefully cut open the bag and enjoy. If the item needs to be enjoyed warm, hot water is added. In this comparison of food slides, we have a typical Thanksgiving Day meal, but this is only typical to the astronauts in space. 
This is only a glimpse of the big sacrifices astronauts have to make when making a mission to the International Space Station. In this Thanksgiving Day meal, we have a typical cranberry sauce, dehydrated cornbread dressing, strawberries, turkey, and some tea with sugar. But there are other options for the astronauts to drink. Although this Thanksgiving meal does not look like the ones that we have here on Earth, that doesn't stop the astronauts from gathering together to eat a meal and reflect back on their hard work and give thanks to all of those who have helped them along the way to get to where they are. Fun facts on eating in space. Taco Bell supplied NASA with its first batch of long-lasting tortillas that had an extended life up to a year. There are speciality trays, plates, and utensils that are magnetized so that they do not fly away. Food packages have Velcro on them to prevent them from floating away. Food with crumbs like cookies, bread, and chips are not allowed as little crumbs from consuming these kinds of food can get stuck in equipment. Carbonated drinks are unsafe in space because carbon dioxide bubbles remain in the fluid and can go through an astronaut's digestive system. Check out the full video on the Science Rendezvous website to learn more about how astronauts eat in space. You know, someday, my friends, when you get to go into space, hopefully you can bring some of your own space food. I have a fun story to tell you. The most recent Canadian astronaut who went into outer space was named David Saint-Jacques. And he spent six months up on the International Space Station. Now his favorite food was his wife's meatloaf. As it's uh, me as well, my, my wife makes a good meatloaf too. And so he loved that food so much that he convinced NASA and the Canadian Space Agency and to get his wife to make lots and lots of meatloaf for six months so that he could have it all cut up, freeze dried, and he could take it up to the International Space Station. So he got to eat his favorite food while he was on the International Space Station. So if you get to be an astronaut someday, what would you take? Hmm. I think, uh, I think I like what a lot of astronauts like, and that's spicy food. You know, astronauts really love spicy food because when you go into space, your nose gets a little bit stuffed up and it can be hard to taste things. But you know, spicy food clears out those sinuses pretty quickly. So spicy food is often an astronaut favorite. All right, now we're gonna start our next Kahoot, our second Kahoot. So I'm gonna welcome our host. This is, we're gonna welcome back Michaela and we're gonna welcome Jen to host our second Kahoot. Hi, Michaela and Jen. Hello everyone. All right, we're gonna get started with the Kahoot. So we have our code open up. So feel free to join on either the Kahoot app or kahoot.it. All right, awesome to see everyone joining. We're gonna give it maybe another 30 seconds here and then we're gonna get started. All right, I think we're looking like we're ready to get started. All right, five more seconds. All right, let's get going. All right, here is our first question. Which food cannot be taken into space as they are? Wow, very good. Okay, so the answer was salt. Salt actually has to be taken into space 
in liquid form because of all the tiny little particles and the microgravity in space when you can't shake the salt onto your food. So it has to be taken up in a liquid form. All right, let's check out the scores. All right, very good job. Move into the next question. What are some criteria for food being taken into space? Do they have to be processed, sticky, compact, or all of the above? We've got another 10 seconds to get those answers in. Wow, looks like a lot of you remembered that one. So they have, all of those have to be, uh, all of those criteria have to be met in order for them to be allowed into space. Let's see that scoreboard. Ooh, looks like we've got some new names up on the scoreboard. Everyone's doing such a great job. Awesome, let's move on to the third question. True or false, some foods can be grown in space. Couple more seconds, get your answers in. The answer is true. Yes, some food can be grown in space. Let's check out and see how the scores are. Oh my, big shift up at the top. Very good job, everyone. All right, let's go into question four. Now, which nutrient is very important for astronauts? And you can pick more than one if you think more than one is right. Is it calcium, iron, vitamin K, or vitamin D? There are 10 seconds left. See if you guys remember this one. Good job. So the answer is actually all of, all of them are right. All of those nutrients are really important for bone health, which is a big concern for our astronauts up in space. Let's see what that scoreboard looks like. Ooh, a lot of new names up there. And we've got one streak of four correct answers in a row. Congrats. Awesome job, everyone. Let's move on to the next question. True or false, astronaut ice cream is a favorite on the International Space Station. Ten more seconds to get those answers in. Do we think it's true or false? The answer is false. Unfortunately, uh, astronaut ice cream does not taste the same as our ice cream that we all love. So astronauts don't always prefer ice cream in the International Space Station. All right, let's see what that did to the scores. Oh my goodness, big shake up at the top. Paige is now on top. Good job, everyone. All right, so let's move on to question six. What is a benefit of dehydrated food? Does it take up less space, last longer, weigh less, or all of the above? You've got a couple more seconds to get your answers in. Good job, everyone. The answer is actually all of the above. Um, so once all the water is taken out, food weighs a lot less, takes up less space, and will last longer in space and won't go bad. So which all of which are really important for longer space travels. All right, let's take a look at that scoreboard. Ooh, we've got some movement on the top five but our first place page is still in the lead. Awesome, all right, let's move on to the next question. 
Now these are pictures. What do we think this is? This is some picture of some space food. Do we think this is tofu? Or do we think this is scrambled eggs? Take your, your pick. Wow, a lot of you guys got that one right. Yes, that was scrambled eggs. One of the favorites of the astronauts on the space station. Let's check out the scores. All right, awesome, awesome. A couple more questions left. Oh, we've got a few more of these pictures to go through. Is this a picture of spinach or coleslaw? What do you guys think? We've got 10 seconds. Wow, most of you got that one right. It is spinach. It's a little hard to tell when it's all dehydrated, but you guys did a great job on that. All right, let's look at the scoreboard. Everyone stayed where they were and we've got an, someone with an answer streak of three. Nice work. All right, next question. There's two more left. All right, here's another picture. What do we think this is? Is this strawberries or are these beets? Ten seconds to get your answer in. It beats me what it is. <laughs> Very good. Oh wow, Every, almost everyone got that one. Strawberries, yes, those were some strawberries. Let's see the scores. Wow, very good job, everyone. Very tight up the up at the top there with one more question left. All right, everyone, this is our last question, our last chance to make a move onto that scoreboard. Is this a picture of shrimp cocktail or roast potatoes? What do you guys think? I see the answers are coming in really quickly. We've got another 10 seconds. And the answer is shrimp cocktail. So that's another one of the astronauts' favorites on the space station. Let's see our final scores. In third place, we have Alex. Congratulations, nine out of 10. Also nine out of 10, Ben in second. And first place, drum roll please. Paige, good job everyone. Thanks for participating in it. I hope you guys learned some things and had a lot of fun. Yeah, well, thanks everybody. Ah, well done everybody. And a special thank you to Michaela and Jen for running that excellent Kahoot. Uh, and of course, a thank you to all of our Eating in Space group. We have Alima, Natali, Jennifer, Michaela, Valentina, Naomi. Thank you for, uh, for doing such a great job. Um, one fun story about Eating in Space as well. Um, we, we talked about growing food in outer space. Space food, to actually grow it in space, it has to be genetically modified a little bit. And maybe not for the reasons that you think. Um, food in space has to be genetically modified so that it doesn't take up too much space. Turns out that in, in space, there's not a lot of space <laughs> when you're an astronaut. You've got to try and make food that stays pretty close together and can still produce a lot of fruit. And so space food tends to be modified so that it can produce big fruits and big vegetables, lots and lots of stuff without sprawling too far away. And for that reason, uh, lights in space that grow food are often purple, blue light and red light put together. One, I think the blue light, it's, I'm pretty sure it's the blue light, keeps the plants from sprawling out and the red light is really good for nourishing the plants. So it looks purple, kind of cool when it comes to space food. So uh, again, to thank you for everybody for doing such a great job with, uh, with the eating in space activity. Now we're gonna move on to Oh, when we're tired, when we've exercised a lot in outer space, when we've filled our tummies with lots of delicious space food, our astronauts, they need to take a little bit of a sleep. And we are gonna welcome um, a few of our, um, 
a, a few of our uh, sleeping people to go and give us a lovely presentation about sleeping in space. So I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa, Rachel, Taryn, and Alexandra to talk about sleeping in space. Okay, thanks, Ryan. So yes, uh, we're going to be beginning with sleeping in space. So let's get started. Okay, so the main ideas that we're going to be talking about in today's presentation is how do astronauts sleep in space, space sleeping bags, sleeping quarters in space, and how long do astronauts have to sleep for. So let's get started. Okay, so first we have a little video showing how Chris Hadfield sleeps in space. Hi, Chris Hadfield here aboard the International Space Station. We keep busy on board the space station. Long days, lots of work, physical exercise. At the end of it, you're tired. But how do you sleep in space? In order to make it comfortable for the astronauts, originally they were going to put us all in one habitation garden with sleep stations all around it. But the way the station was eventually built, we have sleep stations inside Node 2, which is the forward part of the station, and inside the service module, which is in the end. A total of six small bedroom sleep stations, sleep blocks. And inside each one is just a sleeping bag tied to the wall. You might think it's uncomfortable not having a mattress and a pillow. Without gravity, of course, you don't need anything to hold you up. You can just completely relax. And you don't even have to tell in space. You don't even have to hold your head up. So you can relax every muscle in your body. And your arms float up in front of you. Your head tips float. But before I go to sleep, I gotta put in my pajamas. Because I have space pajamas. I'll be right back. Great. I'm in my super comfy Russian full length pajamas. Nice for when you have to get up in the middle of the night and uh, ready to go to bed. I'll show you what I see. This is my sleep station, my sleep pod. This is uh, where I spend up to eight hours every day here on board the space station. It's actually on the floor, but uh, once you're inside, you just can't tell. Okay, that video was super cool. Yeah. Let's go on to the next slide. Oops, my bad. Okay, so when I say the word space sleeping bag, you might have gotten a little preview from that last video, but you might think of a camping bag, sleeping bag that we use. Or you might think of a sleeping bag that has a bunch of astronauts and spaceships on it, but it actually looks like the picture that will come up now. Right in the middle there, very interesting. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so since astronauts are in free fall in space, they use sleeping bags to prevent floating somewhere else while sleeping. They use canvas sleeping bags that have lots of hooks. They loosely strap themselves into the sleeping bags and strap the sleeping bags onto the wall, as you can see on the pictures on the side. Astronauts don't need a nice and fluffy pillow like we do because their heads float and hold themselves up. 
In shorter expeditions, all the astronauts will sleep in the same room, like a big sleepover. But on longer expeditions, they each have their own sleeping quarters, which will be shown in the next slide. Astronauts sleep in sleep stations, uh, like the video showed with Chris Hadfield earlier. Sleep stations are where astronauts sleep and they're about the size of a telephone booth. Inside a sleep station, you can find their sleeping bag, which they strap onto the wall, a lamp, an air vent, a personal laptop where they can do their own research and put in their own data. And it's also a place for their personal belongings. Next slide, please. Astronauts use the Greenwich Mean Time Zone. They use this time zone to maintain a specific schedule for sleep and waking hours. This time zone is a compromise of the Mission Control Centers in Houston, Texas in the United States and Moscow in Russia. Next slide, please. So the circadian rhythm is the body's biological clock. On Earth, for most people, it's a little longer than 24 hours. This is regulated by our daily exposure to light from the sun. In space, however, they, as they orbit the Earth, astronauts experience a sunrise or sunset every 45 minutes. Other factors that affect astronauts' sleep patterns include noise, uncomfortable temperatures, and slam shifts. If you didn't know, a slam shift is an abrupt shift in work rest schedule of about six hours on average, and this is due to completing mission events. Next slide. So disrupting the circadian rhythm not only leads to reduced sleep quantity and quality, but also impairs alertness, reaction time, and cognition. This puts them at much higher risk of fatigue-related accidents, and no one wants an accident. Next slide. So a little fun fact, where an astronaut launches into space from can make a huge difference in sleep disruptions. Astronauts who launch from back on Earth, Kazakhstan, experience better sleep than those who launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida. This could be due to training, pre-flight preparations, and or social activities, or just recovery from jet lag to get to back on Earth. Next slide. So how long do astronauts sleep for? Uh, next slide. So most only sleep for about four to six hours. Uh, next slide. So that doesn't seem like a lot of time, even though they are allotted eight hours of sleep. This is because the body doesn't need as much sleep compared to on Earth as the body becomes less tired quickly and doesn't have to work as hard. This allows for more time to work and exercise and just another thing is sleep disturbances are common. So following a strict sleep schedule, like waking up on at the same time every day and going to sleep at the same time is very important. And just a little fun fact is dreams and nightmares still occur along with snoring too. All right, and there's some extra resources for everybody for learning about space too. Thank you very much to Alyssa, Rachel, Taryn, and Alexander for that excellent presentation about sleeping in outer space. Now, one of the, the favorite things that, that I, I like to think about when I'm figuring out sleeping in space or I'm imagining sleeping in outer space, for me, it's gotta be the Frankenstein arms, right? The fact that they just kind of float in front of you and your arms need to stay there and it's like, you're just like a little zombie walking around. It's kind of weird because everything does float in outer space. So that, that was really cool. Now it's time to do our third Kahoot. We're doing um, a third one. So get your Kahoot apps ready, go to kahoot.it. And we're gonna welcome back Alyssa and Rachel to lead this Kahoot on sleeping in space. So let's test your knowledge. So this Kahoot is going to be on the sleeping presentation. So we'll give everyone a minute or two to um, join the Kahoot. The game pin is above here, 929-6294. And if you would like, you could always join the game 
um, in the middle of the game um, as the game pin is on the bottom right corner. That's a very good point. Thanks, Alyssa. So yeah, if you don't manage to join in time or if you're having, having some technical difficulties, you can always see the game pin at the very bottom of the screen and join us and answer even half the questions just to take part in the fun. So uh, we'll give everyone about 20 seconds to just log in and then we'll start the game soon. Okay, I think um, most people are in. Uh, yeah, let's start the Kahoot game. Sleeping in space. Okay, so the first question is, how many hours of sleep do astronauts need? Is it one to two hours, two to four hours, six to eight, four to six hours? So the correct answer is four to six hours. Good, um, most people got that right. And let's check out the scoreboard. So we have uh, Michaela in the lead. So on to the next question. All right, so this one's true or false. Do astronauts need a pillow for their heads in space? Awesome. Great job. Everyone got that one right. It's false. You do not need a pillow because your head's floating. Let's check out the scoreboard. Great job, Ari. Ari's the number one with a bed close behind. And that's question. Next question. Do astronauts use sleeping bags so they don't float away while they sleep? True or false? So the correct answer is true. Yeah, so in the Chris Hadfield video, you saw that um, they had sleeping bags and they were strapped to the sleep stations. It's good, most people got that right. Uh, let's see the scoreboard. Okay, so now um, the bed emoji and the thumbs up emoji is in the lead. Good, on to the next question. All right, so which of the following is not in an astronaut sleeping station? Water bottle, air vent, sleeping bag, or lamp? Which one is not in the sleeping station? 10 seconds left to answer. Five seconds. And the water bottle is not in the sleeping station. Good job, most of you guys got that one right. And onto the scoreboard, let's see who's winning. And Ari, she has the highest answer streak of four. The bed emoji is in a close second place. Next question. Question five, which of the following is not the correct way to secure a sleeping bag in space? Is it to the ceiling, to the door, to the wall, to the floor? Five seconds left. And the correct answer is to the door. Most people got that right. Yes, you do not want to put your sleeping bag um, towards the door. Yep. So let's check out the scores. And now we have the bed and the thumbs up emoji again, back in the lead. On to the next question. Okay, so true or false, a sleep, 
A strict sleeping schedule is not needed as sleep disturbances are not common. Ten seconds left. Almost everyone's answered. Three, two, one. And that's false. Astronauts are allotted a very strict sleeping schedule. About eight hours is allotted for their free time, which usually includes their sleep. And onto the scoreboard. And sleeping's okay. I'm not sure exactly what that emoji combination means, but I'm going to take it as sleep is good. Is still number one. Miranda's in a close second. And next question. What do the cabins protect the astronauts from when sleeping? Is it outside noises, light, their colleagues, or all of the above? 10 seconds left. And the correct answer is all of the above. Most people got that uh, onto the scoreboard. And we still have the um, bed and thumbs up emoji in the lead with Miranda second. Now on to the next question. All right, true or false, during long trips, all astronauts sleep in one room. Well, during short trips, they have their own sleeping quarters. True or false? Fifteen seconds left to answer. Five seconds left, get your answers in. Great job, that is false. From the video you saw, they all seem to get their own cabin to sleep in during their longer trips. Nuts. And who's in the lead now? The bed emoji still. Quinn has taken over second place. That was a tricky question. On to the next one. Question nine. There have been reports of astronauts snoring in space. True or false? Ten seconds left. And the answer is true. Yes, there have been reports of astronauts snoring in space. Most of you got that onto the scoreboard. And yep, we still have uh, the bed emoji in the lead, followed by Quinn in second. Next question. Guys, this is the last question. Try to get your answers in fast. What orientation do astronauts sleep in? Vertically, horizontally, diagonally, or any orientation? Five seconds left. Ooh, looks like only less than half of you guys got that one. Remember, it's any orientation because the space station floats and spins around as time goes on. And let's see who won. So in third place, we have Mariana. Great job. Second place goes to Quinn. And drum roll, please. First place, 10 out of 10 questions. Was the bed emoji? Good job. I think that's just thumbs up to sleeping. I, I think that's, I feel happy about sleeping. Yes, and that, that takes it. Good job, happy sleeper. Well done. And thank you to Alyssa and Rachel for running that excellent sleeping kahoot. And a special thank you to all of our uh, volunteers who worked on the sleeping pod. That was Michelle, Rachel, Alexandra, Safa, Manur, Taryn, and Alyssa. Thanks for the presentation and for the excellent 
uh, cahoots. That was that was really well done. I think that uh, snoring in space is is kind of a kind of a common thing, right? I think I, if we get tired enough, we snore, and I think that happens down here on Earth as well. So we are going to jump into a pod that I'm actually really excited uh, to talk about because this game is going to be a little bit different, but we're going to talk about personal well-being in space to take care of not just your physical health, but your mental health, your, your personal well-being, what keeps you going, keeps astronauts happy and healthy. And that's surprisingly important. If humans are going to spend eight months in space traveling to, to Mars in the future, that's a long time. You have to take care of this as well as the rest of your body, eating and sleeping and drinking and all of that stuff. So the next game um, is not a not a Kahoot. It's not a game pin. We are actually going to do a little Jeopardy game that's going to be run by our good friends Nigel and Roba. And so I'm going to turn it over to Nigel and Roba. I'm going to help out with this game, but I'm really excited to see what they have to say. So Nigel, it's off to you, yeah. our Jeopardy host. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so as Ryan said, welcome to Jeopardy, presented by Science Rendezvous. My name's Nigel, and I'll be your host for today. We got a great game for you, and today's topic is going to be well-being in space. So today we have Roba, who's going to be our contestant on the show. However, I encourage everyone to participate from wherever you're watching, whether that's from your couch or your kitchen table. Um, although we won't be able to hear you guys shouting your answers, we will still feel your enthusiasm and your excitement right through our screen. So I hope you guys participate, and I hope you guys enjoy it. And just a reminder... We have also attached this game to our website that you guys can check out at any time. So right after this show, this, uh, today's presentation, you'll have access to it. And we will also put the link in the chat box right after the game. So if you want to check it out, uh, there's some awesome questions for you guys and some video clips that I think you guys will really enjoy. Okay, so can we get Roba on our game today? Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic morning and afternoon, and I'm ready to get started. Okay, perfect. So Roba, just going to explain how today's game is going to work. Today we have, we have five categories, but our last category is just video clips. So today we're going to go through emotional well-being, occupational well-being, intellectual well-being, and environmental well-being. There's a total of five questions each for each section, uh, all worth different points. And so you can choose any question from any section that you want. And then we're going to ask you the question. We're going to see uh, whether you know the answer, and then we're going to all learn the answer together. So which question would you like first? Let's start with emotional well-being 300. Okay, perfect. So the question is, what are some of the ways that astronauts can improve their mood? So what do you think? Uh, maybe they take pictures of their family members, or they converse with their fellow astronauts up in the sky, in the space. Okay, so let's check it out. Let's see if you were right. And it seems like you were right. So they do look at pictures and videos of loved ones because while they're in space, they do miss their family. So it's an awesome way for them to connect. They do take pictures of planets and views and views from space, as you can see in our first image. Uh, they do like to play games with fellow astronauts like chess cards, board games that we also enjoy, as you see in our second image. And they also like to make videos of their work to share with people. So they like to take videos of kind of the things they learn in space, what they discover. And they like to show that to us all the way back in Earth so that we can be inspired and we can see uh, what they're up to while they're in space. Okay, perfect. Let's get to our next question. Um, okay, what, what would you like? See, let's see intellectual 300. Okay. So our question is, do astronauts listen to or make music? What do you think? Hmm, I think like Earth, they do both if possible. I think you're right, but let's see. So you were right. Astronauts do play music through similar music players to the ones we have on Earth. So just like we have uh, little radio devices that we can play playlists off of, they do the kind of they do similar things. And they also like to play instruments. So they like to play things like the guitar or wind instruments, such as the saxophone or the trumpet, and it sounds just as good. The only thing is that playing instruments in space is a little bit more difficult because of the zero the zero gravity. However, uh, they still like to make music because it helps them deal with stress. It makes them feel connected to Earth. Uh, and it's a great way with them to connect with their fellow astronauts and spend some time together doing non-space uh, type of work. 
Okay, cool. Interesting. Okay, yeah. let's see environmental 200. Environmental 200, okay. So how do astronauts play tennis and ping pong in space? This is a really cool one. Oh, this is funny. I think they would just swim around, swimming after the ball instead of running for it. Uh, kind of. So let's see. So they do. They do do a little bit of swimming and floating around. But what's unique about space ping pong or tennis is they actually play it using a water droplet. So what they do is they create this ping pong ball by squeezing water droplets out of a drinking bag. So we learned a little bit about the drinking bag earlier uh, in today's presentation. So they use that drinking bag to create a little ping pong ball. And because of the zero gravity in space, the droplet of water just kind of floats around and it's like a little sphere uh, they, that they can hit. And to hit the ball, they use special paddles. So they don't use regular ping pong paddles that we have. They use these special space paddles that repel water. So when they hit it, the ball doesn't make a big splash. It bounces right off the paddle, just like we would do when we were playing ping pong back home. And so if you guys want to check this out, actually, we have a little video clip. We're not going to play it uh, for you today here, but I do encourage you to check it out. It's going to be on video clip 400. It shows you exactly how they make their little uh, ping pong ball. And, and it's a cool demonstration of what playing ping pong exactly looks like. So I think you guys enjoy it. So please check that out right after today's show. Okay, on to the next question. Let's see occupational well-being 500. Occupational well-being 500, okay. Despite the stress of being an astronaut, why do astronauts love their job? So why, why do you think astronauts want to be astronauts? Well, they're discovering new things and adding to science and then plus they get to have fun with being weightless, I think. Okay, let's see. So you're definitely right about the weightlessness. They do get to experience that and being able to float around is fun. So if you look in our little video clip, our astronauts having a, a good time doing a bunch of somersaults and acrobats. They also get to work on the International Space Station. So many of the astronauts are also engineers and scientists and getting to contribute to the, to the development of that space station can be fun and is a really proud achievement for them, especially because the space station is something that some of the world's best astronauts get to contribute to. So it's very prestigious for them. And lastly, they get to see Earth from above, which is very surreal and cool. Uh, and it's definitely a once in a lifetime experience that you'd only get to experience from space. So it's definitely something that's really cool for them. Interesting. One day we'll be on there, hopefully. And let's see, someone said in the chat that what would happen if you hit the ball really hard? Uh, really good question. Honestly, if you hit the ball really hard, it would just act like you were kind of playing ping pong and tennis. So if you hit the ball really hard, it would just be a little bit harder for the opposing player to hit it. But because of the resistance uh, in the air, it wouldn't go too far. So it's not like they're going to hit the water ball across the space station. It would just be a little bit harder uh, for the opponent to hit it back. But good question. Okay, let's get one more question in here, Roba. Okay, how about emotional again? And this time we'll go big, we'll go 500. 500, okay, big question. How do astronauts prepare for the pressure and stress that comes with being in space? Hmm. I think before they board the spaceship, they go a lot of, through a lot of training with the spaceship agency and that trains them, I would think, and maybe simula simulators um, to Absolutely. prepare them for what's... Yep. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So because... Uh, going to space is such a long experience like as in terms of the effort that you have to put in in training but also the time you spend in space the astronauts have to go through extensive training uh, which includes simulating space flight experiences through virtual reality as well as a workload schedule that mimics the routine that they would have in space so astronauts will also simulate space missions on earth by being placed in confined spaces for 45 days so they they know what they're kind of getting themselves into once again to space and how they deal with their isolation and confinement. And also astronauts may begin seeing a psychiatrist every two weeks so experts can track their mental health, but also how they can learn to deal with their, their stress and anxiety in ways that they can combat it. Uh, and we've already learned some of the things that they like to do in terms of music, uh, playing games, sports, and, and we'll find out some other more ways uh, through this presentation. Interesting. Okay. 
What would you like now? Okay, one more question. Uh, let's try environmental and we'll go 500. Environmental 500, okay. Okay, are there plants on the space station? What do you think? I would hope so. I think plants are so important. Well, let's see. And you were right. There are plants on the space station and they grow in a laboratory setting which contains artificial lights pretending to be the sun. And the plant seeds are also planted in a nutrient rich fertilizer and they're watered regularly. Plants and flowers are so important to life in space because gardening boosts the immune system. So it makes you healthier. It's comforting and also allows the astronauts to feel connected to Earth. And this becomes increasingly important the longer astronauts are away from Earth where natural food is vital. And as we heard today, if you can grow your own food uh, in the form of plants, uh, that definitely plays a huge way in terms of nutrition. Uh, so you don't have to pack so much food uh, when you just take off from, the, from Earth. And we got a quick question, how are plants watered in space? Good question. So we saw earlier that uh, our astronauts use these types of watering bags. So what they do is they take off the nozzle off the watering bag and they attach kind of like a little faucet to it. So if you do gardening with your parents back home, you have like a hose and then a little spray gun to spray. And they have something similar to that where they can use like a little spray that they can uh, direct the water right over their plants. I think we have time for a few more questions, Roba. Nice. Okay, I'll go with occupational 100. Occupational 100, okay. Why did astronauts want to become astronauts? So this is similar to a question we had earlier, uh, but this is, so why did they want to study to become astronauts, basically? Well, I would say for the idea of exploring what the space has for us, and maybe if we can go live there, hopefully one day. Okay, let's see. So I don't know if they'll be able to live there one day, but with the way science is going, uh, you never know because astronauts are always discovering something new. So that's one of the main reasons they wanted to become astronauts is they get to constantly explore and make new discoveries and that's really exciting for them. And also astronauts grew up loving aerospace, math, science and technology in school. And so becoming an astronaut allowed them to combine all those passions into a career. And we also have a video that you guys can check out. It just basically interviews the astronauts and asks them why they wanted to become an astronaut, which is, I believe it's video clip 10 uh, that you can check out after. And it might be something that you want to check out if you really like astronomy, science, technology, math, uh, and you're thinking about being an astronaut, maybe you'll check out this video and they'll show similar interests to you have. And maybe you'll start thinking about becoming an astronaut someday yourself. Okay, let's get one more question, Roba. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Let's go to intellectual 500. Intellectual 500, okay. So what language do astronauts typically study and practice in space? This is a really interesting one. I would assume sign language. Or, or the language they speak, they spoke down on Earth. Like if they were English, then they would speak English. Okay, <laughs> let's see. So originally the official working language on the space station was English. So most procedures Daddy, were in English. Sam, because, that, that's my spot. Because English was the general language of the station. However, in recent years, launching off into space is generally done through Russian territory and is typically commanded by Russian commanders. Due to the control center also being in Russia, English and Russian have become working language, languages on the International Space Station. And so the astronauts must study and practice English and Russian. So if they're already speaking English, they need to speak Russian. If they don't speak either, they need to study both in school and go through classes before they can enter space. Okay, and that seems like all the time that we have today. Uh, I hope you guys really enjoy our Jeopardy game. Just a reminder that you can check out the game and play it at any time from the link that we are gonna be putting in our chat box right after this. Uh, there yeah. are 20 questions yeah. and five super cool videos that you can check out. Uh, so please be sure to check that out. And on behalf of me, myself, 
and the entire Science Rendezvous team. Thank you for tuning into Jeopardy with us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of today. Thanks, guys. Excellent job, Nigel and Roba. That was, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing all that cool stuff. One thing that it got me thinking about was that the one, the one thing that you'll notice about astronauts is they very rarely go into space alone. One of the things that keeps people's mental health very strong is other people. It's really important that we have, uh, humans are very social animals, right? We are very, we like to have others around. And so it's really important to always make sure that you're, you're making new friends, keeping your old ones. Um, and especially for astronauts, they, they really have to be good at, at working well with other people. The good news is, is that astronauts come from a variety of different disciplines, not just science or engineering, but there's a lot of doctors up in space too. It turns out space medicine is pretty important because well, the nearest hospital, at least from the ISS, is 400 kilometers away and it's moving a little bit slower. So you have to be a little bit careful. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. And of course, to all of the group, uh, the volunteers from University of Wealth Humber for uh, the personal well being section. That was Amanda, Christina, Nigel, Miriam, Nikki, and Roba. So thanks for doing such a great Jeopardy game. I, I, I do love some Jeopardy from time to time. So we're gonna go on to our last section. Thanks to everybody for sticking with us so far. And uh, we did notice a couple of questions in the chat. So thank you for those. For everybody else who's listening, please feel free to type some questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, if we have a little bit of time at the end or even throughout the program, I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you have as well. But we're gonna go into our last section. Sadly, our last section, and this is on waste management, managing waste in space. So I'm going to be um, inviting a couple of our volunteers to join in, uh, in our spotlight here so that you can all see them. So I'm going to add uh, Jessica and I have to add Pardeep as well. There's Pardeep, awesome, look at that. You, see, you make it easy for me. So here's Jessica and Pardeep who are gonna talk a little bit about waste management in space. It's all yours. Thanks, Ryan. Um, hi, I'm Jessica and this is Pradeep. Um, today we'll be ta talking a little bit about what happens to garbage in space. Um, astronauts make garbage just like us, uh, but they can't just put it out for the garbage truck like you guys. Uh, so what do they do? First, they want to recycle everything they can. Uh, they reuse their old wastewater by filtering it and using it again. So they'll reuse water that they used to bathe, water from their sweat, and even water from human waste, which seems a little bit gross, but it's not too bad after they filter everything gross out of there. Um, they also even reuse the air that they breathe. Um, but what happens to the things that astronauts cannot recycle? They can't just keep it up there with them. There's not a lot of room up there. Uh, they need to put it somewhere. So do they just release it into space and forget about it? No, uh, just like on Earth, astronauts do not like to litter. So what do they do? They put all their garbage in a machine called a compactor that squishes it together into small tiles so that they can pack as much as they can into a spacecraft and then launch it into the atmosphere where it'll burn up, which is kind of cool. Uh, so let's hear from an actual astronaut about how they take out the trash on the International Space Station. Hey, Mike here. Let's talk trash. What do we do with trash at the International Space Station? Several different ways. If it's just dry trash, paper kind of thing, so go in a plastic bag uh, that, that, that we, we fill full of. And eventually, once it gets full, we compress it, kind of wrap it with tape, and we put it in a, in, a, in a bag to collect them, ready for one of the cargo ships to head home, and, and we'll push them in there. For the wet trash, though, leftover food packets and things like that, we have to pack that a little more carefully. So first of all, we'll take the, the, the bits of food and put them in one of the wrappers that hold, uh, hold the food uh, uh, portions of food, come in some kind of a foil wrap. And we'll take the, the leftovers. There's really not many leftovers as far as food goes. We just eat it all because you want to get the air out of there. And then you want to seal these up. And that's what's really great about these. Is you, they actually seal it's made of the same kind of material that the lining of our spacesuit is made out of. And so it's uh, it's really good, it's really tough, and it's good at sealing. And, and 
you seal it by securing it's like a like kind of like a rubber band that goes around it you wrap it a bunch of times and then push this through and it actually holds together in a uh, surprisingly uh, strong fashion kind of get that, that loop under the thumb the hard one to get started is the first one there see that the bag is secured now with a pretty good area and that won't let the air out there's this leftover food's going to sit up here for quite a bit of time sometimes months before the next ship is leaving to go burn this stuff up in the atmosphere on the way down and so it, you just need to have it sealed as securely as you possibly can. So just like there's a limited amount of space on the space station for garbage, there's also a limited amount of space on Earth. So what can we do to make sure our garbage takes up as little space as possible in our landfills? Can you guys think of a way to reduce the amount of space garbage that takes up on Earth? Type some of your ideas in the chat and I'll just give you a couple of seconds to share your thoughts with everyone. So what are ways to reduce the amount of space that our garbage takes up on here on Earth? So you can type it in the chat or just, you know, voice it out to everyone by turning on your mic. Yeah, recycling is a good idea. Recycling, we've been doing that forever and it's been working really well. Switch, yeah, compact it or burn it. That's a really good way to reduce the space as well. Uh, we're actually gonna teach you how to eco brick, which is basically compacting your garbage. Um, sustainable options, yeah, that's very good as well. Recycling and using reusable water bottles, that's a very good way to reduce the amount of garbage we have, a lot of the waste we have is just plastic water bottles, which is awful for the environment. Yep, non-plastics, biodegradable materials, burn it, that's a good one. Yeah, share it with people if you can. So you have like clothes that you don't wear, you can definitely donate. Um, that's very sustainable. So good job, everyone. Um, I'm now gonna pass it over to Jessica, who's gonna teach us how to eco brick. All right, thanks so much for everyone who answered. Um, we're gonna go over just one small specific way we can reduce the amount of waste um, as the space that our waste takes up. Um, so eco-bricking is a process of quite literally packing as much single-use plastic into a plastic water bottle or pop bottle before th throwing it away. Um, and I'm gonna show you. Um, just after I do a quick explanation. So you take your plastics, like snack wrappers, straws, plastic cutlery, or even bigger plastics um, can be cut up and put into this bottle. Um, you pack as much as you can using like a stick or a ruler or even a marker that's all you used up um, before you dispose of it. And that just makes it um, take up less space in our landfill. And it's a simple process that anyone can do at home. I'm just gonna show you quickly now. So. I have my water bottle here. You just take the cap off. You can take, I collected some garbage that my family has used recently and you just stuff as much, see how much space it takes up here. And you put it all in this bottle. So take that. I can use my marker to stuff it down in there. And then you can even take stuff like straws, cut them up and put them in. So I'm just gonna cut a piece off. Take that piece there and put it in. So once you put all of your garbage in there, you compact it as much as you can down to the bottom. You can put your cap back on and throw it out. So you guys can do this at home if you'd like after Science Rendezvous um, with your family. It's a cool activity. Um, yeah, so through the process of eco-bricking, just like our astronauts up on the space station, um, we can hopefully reduce the amount of space that our single-use plastics take up in the landfill, making a greener Earth for all of us.
Excellent job, Jessica and Pardeep. Thank you for uh, for sharing that. Eco bricking is something that I had no idea about um, a while back, and so uh, so it's nice to learn about something uh, something really something new. I, I love it, and it's you know ways that ways that we can be sustainable um, here on Earth that that we can learn from space. One of the things that we often um, we often don't talk about is is why why do we go into space? I mean, I am asked this quite often as an astronomer, but people say, well, why do we spend so much money on going into space? What's the point? Why should we bother when we have so many things to manage down here on Earth? And the answer is, is that it's pushing the limits of our technology. That's the goal, is if we can do something that's as difficult as living in space, flying into space, going farther, that forces us to invent new technologies, to create new ways to solve problems. And as it turns out, those solutions often have other applications on Earth. The only reason that we have cellular devices, the only reason that we can communicate over wireless technology, the only reason we have GPS, all of that came from the space program to get astronauts to the moon uh, quite a long time ago. So it's really interesting the different things that come out of space flight. And we're still seeing a lot of that today. There's advances in medicine, robotics, um, and uh, especially, well, especially robotics with, uh, with our Canada arm as well. And for anybody who doesn't know about, uh, about Canada arm, it, there's, a, there's a little robot I wanna show you about up in space. Uh, this is Dexter. Dexter is a multi-armed robot built in Canada by MDA Robotics. And Dexter has uh, 12 elbows, which is kind of nice. I, I kind of wish I had 12 elbows. Um, so I could do different things. And, um, and Dexter the robot, its job is to go outside of the space station where it's very dangerous for astronauts to go on a spacewalk. And, and Dexter the robot can do things that uh, make it safer for astronauts. They don't have to go out into space. They don't have to go on a spacewalk. They can control it from in the space station and it can be controlled from the ground in uh, at CSA headquarters uh, just outside of Montreal. So pretty cool kind of thing. So all these technologies, uh, not just for sustainability, but for just for so many different aspects of life come from space technologies. And I'm hopeful that more sustainable technologies will come from learning about how to manage uh, astronaut garbage as well. So thanks a lot for that program. And we're gonna thank all of our volunteers from the University of Guelph Humber who did the waste management section. That is Jessica, Thomas, Pardeep, Jennifer, Florencia, Maniha, and Brianna. So thank you very much for that. Now, my friends, look at that. I was so worried about running out of time because we had so much to cover, but we ended up finishing a little bit early. So at this point, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, feel free to, uh, to putter on out if you have other things to do. It's a beautiful day outside. I'm gonna be here to answer any questions that you would like to ask about anything to do with flying in space. It seems we still have a few of our, our students hanging out as well who could certainly help us answer some questions, but what do you want to ask about? What do you want to know? What else, what did you learn today? Did anybody want to share something that they learned that they really didn't know or that they really enjoyed? We get a thank you in the chat from Quinn. And, and of course, thank you to all of our volunteers today from the University of Guelph Humber, from Astronomy in Action, from Let's Get Together for, for partnering together on this amazing experience for Science Rendezvous 2021. It is the first ever virtual Science Rendezvous, and we're very hopeful that next year we'll get to see each other face-to-face uh, -face and connect like astronauts um, really do. So officially, we will call this the end, but there is another, um, another uh, University of Guelph Humber activity happening at about 2.30. So that is gonna be, it's, it's called, I'm almost certain that's the person. I'm almost certain that's the person. It's a facial recognition activity that's gonna take place at 2.30. Um, and the video link is um, on the Science Rendezvous website. So you're welcome to, um, to check that out. And we can't recommend you, uh, can't recommend enough um, this activity. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So, uh, but thank you everybody for joining. As I said, I'm gonna stick around for some other questions. Uh, my name is Ryan, I'm, I'm your, uh, your MC for today. We have to thank everybody at the University of Guelph Humber, all the volunteers for doing such great work um, and learning about the International Space Station so that they could share it with you. So here is our ISS. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Perfect. Go ahead, my friend. But how 
happens if the Earth spins backwards? Well, that would be a very bad thing. Luckily, the Earth, we're not too worried about it spinning backwards because it's been spinning forwards for about four and a half billion years, which is a long time. I'll, I'll show you how, how big of a number that is in the chat. So 4.5 billion years is a really long time. Uh, that's how many years there in the chat. So if you um, if the Earth all of a sudden decided to spin backwards, it would have to stop first. And I don't know if you know this, but as the Earth rotates, you and I, we're actually spinning at over 600 kilometers an hour right now. It doesn't feel like it, right? But everything, everything around you is moving around the earth, including the air that you breathe, the things in your home, uh, the trees outside, all of that stuff is moving at over 600 kilometers an hour as the earth turns. And so if the earth all of a sudden stopped, well, we would all go flying, <laughs> probably out into outer space. Uh, although 600 kilometers wouldn't get us into space per hour wouldn't get us into space. But, um, but then, so then if the earth decided to spin backwards, well, the sun would appear to rise in the west and set in the east, right? It would mess up the time zones a little bit, but if the earth did spin the other way, it probably wouldn't be too much of a big deal. Uh, if you had a nice view of the sunrise uh, from your home, now you'd have a nice view of the sunset. <laughs> so not too, too bad, right? But, um, and Mariana has a great follow-up question there. Why don't we feel the earth moving? Well, the answer is still, so still acceleration. We don't feel uh, we don't feel speed. We feel acceleration. So what I mean by that is, if you think about being in a car, you're in a car and you close your eyes and you plug your ears. You don't really feel like you're moving necessarily. But if the car speeds up, you get full. You get pushed back. If the car slows down, you go full. You you um, fall forward. So uh, that you feel. But if you're just traveling at a constant speed, you don't feel that. It's the same as in an elevator, right? If you ever go into an elevator, when the elevator first starts moving, that's where you feel it go, and you kind of feel the sinking feeling in your, in your stomach. And then it's moving, and you don't feel it. And then it gets to the top, and it slows down, and you get that sinking feeling again. So you feel acceleration and not speed. That's why we don't feel the Earth moving, is that the Earth isn't speeding up or slowing down. It's moving at a constant speed. All right, Samara asks, where is the ISS right now? Ooh, great question. Well, this is where it is in my program, but I'm gonna skip ahead to right now. Turns out it's on, looks like it's on the nighttime side of the earth. Yeah, it's nighttime right now, but I'm gonna show you a really neat little uh, resource. If you want to know where you can go to see the International Space Station, if you go to, I'm gonna uh, post a website for you and I'll show it to you, spotthestation.nasa.gov. There's the website in the chat. You can go to this site and type in where you live. And, uh, and you can say, you know, oh, I live in, in, in Brampton or Richmond Hill or Toronto. You can live a little bit up north in Newmarket. Wherever you live, you can put in your location. So let's pick Toronto. You go view sighting opportunities. And now we can see not exactly where the ISS is right now, but you can actually see it up in the sky. It turns out it's actually the third brightest thing in the, in the sky after the sun and the moon. It's brighter than any planet or any star, and you can see it travel over you in the sky. So it turns out that uh, today, tonight, I should say, at, well, 3 a.m., so that we those passed already. So I guess tomorrow morning at 2.15 a.m., for two minutes, you can see the ISS if you feel like um, getting up at 2.15 in the morning, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. All right, so the ISS, uh, you know, it does move around pretty quickly. So when you see it go through the sky, you don't get a lot of time. Uh, the Rumble family says, do we know where the rocket debris is going to land? I, I presume you mean the rocket debris from the uh, Chinese space station. So for anybody who doesn't know this story, um, there's a, a space station that's be being built by China right now. And they sent up a rocket to take up one of the, the space station modules. I think it was like the living quarters or something. And, uh, and what happened was as the rocket, um, as rockets go up, sometimes they do what's called staging. They have multiple booster rockets that burn at different times. So one of the rockets burns and then the next rocket burns and then the next rocket burns. Well, one of those stages um, fell back down and they don't know where it's gonna land. It's gonna fall back down to earth into the atmosphere and they're not sure where it's gonna land. Now this is generally thought of as bad practice in um, when it comes to space flight, because you wanna make sure that if you're gonna put something up there, that it doesn't fall down and hurt somebody. 
Now, we don't know where the rocket debris is gonna land. There is a good, um, uh, I think it, I'm trying to remember the news site that posted about it yesterday, but there, the chances of it falling on Canada are zero. It's not gonna go into Canada anywhere. It's gonna land somewhere a little bit further south latitude. But as you can kind of tell, when we look at the earth, most of it is water. The earth is 70% water. So there's a seven in 10 chance that the rocket debris hits water and not land. And then on top of that, even less likely that it hits a city. So I think we're gonna be, I think we're gonna be okay. But thanks for that question, Rumble family. All oh, right, Abigail says, do you know if there are any asteroids near the earth that could cause harm? There are, but the good news is that uh, we track them. Astronomers keep very close watch of all the different things that are in space that are kind of floating around that could crash into the earth that I think are bigger than about 10 meters. So about the size of your house, a little bit bigger than that. Uh, and that's important because those could cause harm. Good news is though, those, those things don't hit the earth very often. Most of them hit uh, every, you know, every hundred years we get one that hits, that's about that big. And again, it can hit anywhere on the earth. So chances are it's gonna end up in the ocean and not cause any harm. So there are asteroids that are near the earth, but we can track them hundreds of years into the future. One of the amazing things about science is that astronomers, scientists, mathematicians, engineers, we can predict exactly where rocks are gonna fly through space for thousands of years. Science is something that allows us to make predictions about the future and actual predictions that will come true. So we can predict where those asteroids are gonna be thousands of years in the future, and not perfectly, but pretty close. And then we can start to look at the ones that might come to earth and might cause us a little bit of harm. So luckily we don't have to worry about anything right now, but if we did, you can bet you'll hear about it. All right. Thanks Abigail for that question. Let's see if an asteroid rocket landing in an ocean could cause a tsunami. It depends on how big it is, Sumer. It depends on how big that, that rock actually is. Um, and what actually ends up happening is um, if the asteroid hits too fast, the explosion can be so large, it just vaporizes instead of, uh, and, and would then cause a tsunami, but that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, Mariana asks, is it hard to get into the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, as an engineer? I think it is. I mean, I, it's, if a lot of people want to do something and there's not a lot of jobs, it can be difficult. But um, I think, you know, the Canadian Space Agency has jobs for more than just engineers. Um, I'm presuming you want to be something like an aerospace engineer. The way I see it is, I know, I know they do offer internships for one. I actually think I saw one the other day come up, but if you want to be an engineer and work for a particular company or a particular organization, go and talk to that organization. You know, maybe you're, I don't know how old you are, Mariana, but maybe you're pretty young right now and want to be an engineer someday for the Canadian Space Agency. You should reach out to somebody at the Canadian Space Agency and talk, you're 14, amazing. So you've got a few years ahead of you. So I would go and, and reach out to somebody at, at the Canadian Space Agency and say, hi, I'm Mariana. I really want to be a space engineer someday. And I really love space in Canada. And I really want to work for the Canadian Space Agency. I bet they would give you lots of really great information. I bet you'd get to meet some of the people that you might get to work with someday. And I, yeah, like email them. Yeah, definitely. Every organization like that has uh, like a, a media person, an outreach person, a contact. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Uh, it's sometimes the best way to get things in the world is just to ask for them. Right. And I, I know if it was me, if I was, let's say, a, an engineer at the Canadian Space Agency and somebody got in touch with me and said, hey, I'd really love to know what your job is like. I'd really like to know how you do things. I'd really like to know what it's like to work there. I'd, I'd be thrilled. I would love to tell you about it, because you know what? When you love doing something, you love sharing it, too. Right. I love doing astronomy, so I love sharing it, too, as you can tell. So I think you should definitely get in touch with the Canadian Space Agency. I'm sure people there would love to hear from you. And really the worst case is that they're gonna say no. And then you could try somebody else. You could try another organization. You could try and, but, but don't, don't get discouraged if somebody tells you no, because sometimes that just means it's not the right time. But I think, I think it would go really well for you. All right, awesome. Uh, can, can we see a space? Another one. I have another one. Oh my gosh, Rita says, can we see a spaceship launch in Ontario? Uh, well, I, I've never seen a spaceship launch in Ontario. Most of them have to launch um, 
in very specific places, places that are a little bit far away from uh, from from people. <laughs> if we, Southern Ontario is pretty populated, so if you wanted to see a rocket launch, you'd have to go somewhere um, a little bit farther away. And this is often why uh, things are are launched in Cape Canaveral in Florida. So here, you know, let's let me show you a, a launch here. <laughs> This, this is a rocket that launched in uh, Cape Canaveral. This is actually the Perseverance rover that's now on Mars that, uh, that launched uh, last July. So about almost a, almost a year ago, maybe 10 months ago. And you can see it's right on the coast. It's right by the ocean. Part of the reason for that is that when this, the rocket launches, um, when it does do its staging, right? When it does release one uh, rocket stage, when it goes up and, and uh, when that stuff falls back to Earth, it can land in the ocean and not on people. So I imagine launching a rocket in southern Ontario would be really, really bad. <laughs> so, uh, so Rita, I don't think we like to launch things um, from Ontario because there's just too many people around. So maybe on the East Coast, right? Maybe in Newfoundland, we could launch some stuff in, uh, into space, which is kind of cool. Okay, let me skip ahead so we can actually uh, watch this. Does a white hole exist, though? Does a white hole exist? Oh, well, we haven't. Um, nobody's ever seen one. Uh, the idea with a, a white hole is that, it, you know, if you go into a black hole, pot potentially, which does exist, maybe it will spit you out somewhere else in the universe. And, uh, and it's really hard to prove that, right? If you try to go into a black hole, first of all, you'd be torn to pieces. Second of all, you'd be burnt by the radiation, so not very good. And, uh, and third of all, uh, you don't know where you're going to go. <laughs> so if you do fall into a black hole, who knows where you're going to end up? It's really hard to measure that. So we don't know if the other side of a black hole actually exists. We don't know if it is actually a portal to another dimension or another place in space. Um, there's no evidence for it yet. But it doesn't mean that it won't happen. Because this is the cool thing about science is that we kind of have to use our imagination and come up with good theories so that people with telescopes, astronomers with telescopes, scientists who are operating spaceships can go and try and prove those theories, whether they're right or wrong. And look, we're gonna see a launch finally. <laughs> and then my friends, I think we'll, uh, we'll call it here after this. I wanna thank everybody for the awesome questions as we launch this into space. I turned off the audio so I wouldn't, um, kill you all with the loud noises. <laughs> but hey, what a great way to end Take Me to Space from the University of Guelph Humber than to actually launch a rocket into space. Um, rockets launch all the time these days. And even the International Space Station uh, has a rocket visit it at least once every three months to bring up supplies, to take uh, some uh, experiments up and to bring old experiments back down to the surface um, of the earth. So, so thanks everybody for hanging out. We're gonna end there. We'll take one last look at our International Space Station as, uh, as we sign off. And one last look from me. So thank you very much for joining us today. And, uh, and for all of the excellent volunteers from the University of Guelph Humber, uh, from Astronomy in Action and from Let's Get Together, we're, uh, we're offering you a very special thank you for joining us on this journey to space. Happy Science Rendezvous. We'll see you next year. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.